So working on part four now. Um, I'm still working on his armor. Still using the Createx Illustration Pain Spray at the moment. So I have some more leather texture to put in. Uh, there's still some more chainmail to do. Um, but the good thing with this point uh, is I'd actually managed to find a better way to do the chainmail. So starting off, I lay down a a light coat as I'm doing right here um, it's so light that I can actually still see the drawing coming through from underneath uh, so using that as a guideline I then scratch in the uh, the detail scratch in the chainmail over top of that paint as you can see there I I did lose a bit of footage but um, you get the general idea of what happened there all of the that chainmail has been redrawn back in so I can now follow that and fill in all my negative spaces using a very thick mix of uh, the Payne's Grey. So there's probably not a lot of reducer in this mix. Um, somewhere probably between 70 to 80 percent paint. Um, the rest is reducer. Um, yeah, it's it's not about building up as much this uh, like textures slowly with this this uh, chainmail. I want a really you know good coverage to drop the background in. Um, otherwise, you know, it's going to take forever to, to build up to that uh, that density. If you understand what I mean there. And I don't have to be particularly neat with this either. So as you can see, that looks quite ugly. Um, but that's fine because I will go back over and redraw that chainmail back in. Because I can still see uh, the pattern there. So I have I still have guidelines to follow. And you basically see it come to life there. It's um, you know, as soon as you scratch that that chainmail back in, it's all that negative space gets pushed backwards, and the chainmail is brought forward, which um, gives it that that uh, that depth that I'm I'm looking for. So over this area is um, the leather look. See, I do jump around a little bit. Um, sort of gets a bit tedious working in the one spot, especially doing this chainmail. So you find that I I jump over and do a little bit of leather texture from time to time. And just helps with continuity as well. So you know if you find you spend too long in one area, you might overdo the the detail, and then suddenly it doesn't match the rest of the picture. So it does pay to jump around, and not only that, but <clears throat> step back every now and then take a look at the whole piece and view it as a as a whole piece not just each individual part um, because if you spend too long looking at one section um, you kind of lose lose focus of the whole piece um, and you know it's, it's all got to tie in together so what I do is every now and then have a break just stand back assess where you're at see if it's it's all working together and the good thing about working light to begin with and building up slowly is you can it you can kind of see if there's a potential for for a mistake coming um, and you, you can sort of steer away from it as you as you're working towards it gives you that little bit of freedom so with the leather um, again I'm I'm trying to do as much of the leather with the airbrush as I can um, very minimal uh, erasing like I am just doing there but um, the erasing is best done on the very first light coat um, so it's it's not too harsh um, as you as you're working over top of that with the paint um, the te as you're adding texture over top of that it pushes that texture back further and further and and does soften it up so um, you know, I, I don't really want to use erasers past this point. Um, otherwise, I'm going to end up with really sharp, um, sharp uh, texture, which you know the the leather doesn't have that that effect. It's it's a very subtle, organic kind of a texture, very soft. So, to do that, I think I've mentioned on previous videos that um, I use an on-off technique with the airbrush. So, keep the air running, but pulling the trigger back. 
back and forth very, very quickly and very, very short. Um, you know, I'm not pulling it back very much at all because I don't want much paint to come out at all. Um, and the paint again is very over reduced um, because if you have it too thick and you pull back and you pull back a little bit too far, you can end up with a, you know, a very dark spot, which um, it's not going to ruin it, but it's, it's just going to make it harder to to fix up and and um, you know you you've got to try and make it a little little bit more subtle. Um, so over reducing is the way to go, and if you find that it's way too over reduced, then you can always add a little bit more paint. It's it's no issue. Um, but yeah, don't be too scared to add texture in on the lower the uh, lighter passes. Um, because each time you go over top of that with more texture, that texture does come through and it helps build on, on each layer, So, um, which is great for depth. And you will find that when you finally finished your last pass, the detail that you laid down on the very first, the first coat, you can still see bits and pieces of that and it really, really adds to the effect. So here I'm, I'm, I'm erasing a line just to give myself a very distinct, uh, very distinct line between um, the chainmail and the belt. Um, and this is fine in this instance because I'm going to add a very, very dark drop shadow right underneath that belt, which will soften the edge, edge of that belt up. Because, um, like I said, um, sometimes erasing can look out of place because in a, a piece that's fairly soft it can create a very harsh you know a, a very harsh line and uh, it does it, it can stand out quite quite significantly um, so softening those those parts up is, is um, fairly critical um, but also very easy to do as well so like I said like I mentioned before I'm um, jumping around you can see I haven't even finished the chain mail I've um, I sort of got a little bit sick of that, so I started working other areas in just to keep the interest going. Um, wasn't quite ready to tackle the, the chainmail all in one hit because it, it is a very tedious process. But the good part is, is there wasn't a lot more. Uh, this is a little bit below this, um, but other than that, there wasn't much more. So nearly done with the chainmail. You see me using um, freehand stencils made out of cut paper. Um, it's super, super handy because uh, uh, I think I mentioned it before, but they can be cut to shape like that one. And I, I do, I do always keep them handy as well because you can guarantee at some point in the in the uh, piece the shape will come in handy again, um, even though it's been cut out for a specific area. It's just got multiple uses. Um, so I don't tend to chuck them until the very end of a project and I have that massive purge where I, I need to clean the whole workstation up and chuck everything out. Um, I'll only get rid of them then. Otherwise, if I do lose a piece of paper, it's just easy enough to cut. Not forever searching for a stencil. So here I'm just using a fan tip brush uh, just to create some hair texture. So again I sprayed a very light mix and uh, with vertical strokes I've uh, run that brush downwards um, and that's just scratched in some, some hair textures there. Uh, the 
fan tip brush that I've got. It's actually got, um, it's, it's pretty much caked with paint now because I've been using it for a few years, never washed it, but um, it's, it's worked really well for, for that technique now because the, um, the bristles are quite hard, um, really effective. Um, there I'm using a fiberglass brush, so it's very similar to a, um, the, the technique of the fan tip brush, but the fi uh, fiberglass hairs on that are so fine that it gives you a really, really fine effect of hair. Um, but I found that the, um, uh, the fiberglass brush isn't too effective on UPO paper if you let paint dry for too long. Um, it's very hard to erase, so I, I tend not to use it very much. Um, but I have heard that it's um, it's very useful on um, some of the other synthetic papers like the, the Drew Blair paper. So for the sword handle, um, you can see I'm using a paintbrush. I um, sort of came to this decision. It was either this or um, I used the airbrush to do this, but uh, my technique running left left to right, running horizontal, I can't, I can't pull a, as steady a line as I can if I'm running the airbrush straight up and down vertically. So um, if I was to use the airbrush to do these lines, I would likely turn the picture almost 90 degrees so those lines would be vertical. Um, and the muscle memory movement that I have for airbrushing uh, with a vertical motion is so much more steady and consistent than if I was to, you know, left and right motion horizontal. Um, not sure why, but it's just, yeah, it's got so much more control running straight up and down. I, I kept the, um, the mix fairly reduced again for this because I didn't want to, you know, lay the paintbrush down and suddenly there's a really harsh dark line that just stands out, you know. I, I thought if it's not light enough, that's fine. I can just repeat the process and go back over it, but I would rather, again, build up light and uh, slowly work it up rather than, you know, have to having to fix things and, and tone things back. So yeah, this worked out really well. So I thought as well, if the um, paintbrush looked a little bit out of place and looked a bit harsh, I can always uh, just go back over it with the airbrush just to soften it up and, you know, uh, merge it back into this piece, but um, it actually really worked with the paintbrush alone anyway, so I was quite quite happy with that. And you can see I'm softening some of those uh, those lines up now. Just helps helps bring the piece back together. I held off on doing this bit because I was kind of dreading it. It's, um, it's a lot of tight detail. Um, and um, I hadn't at that stage figured out how I was going to go about it. It was only kind of the last minute that I decided I'm going to use a paintbrush for that one. And even then I, I gave it a bit of a test. You know, just did a tester piece and thought, yep, that looks alright, that's the way I want to go. I wasn't going to go straight onto the piece and start doing it. Again, just using my uh, freehand shields. I reckon that was just a straight edge there. I'm trying to give that the uh, a bit of a steel, uh, an effective steel. So scratching some tiny little highlights in there, some just some textures that you'd find in steel, like little nicks and grazes. Probably common characteristics of a a sword that's seen a lot of battle. You see that um, freehand shield that I cut was actually cut out for another area and um, it turned out that was perfect for that uh, the hilt of the sword.
makes a world of difference when you scratch some highlights in there, sharpen the whole area up. So I've got some deep bruised purple, which is um, still Createx illustration, and, but it's from the Bloodline range. Jumping a couple of steps here, um, I'm just dusting in some of that um, that colour into the handle of the sword. Um, I just got a bit excited. I wanted to see what it looks like. So sometimes I do that. I'll jump a few steps ahead just to get an idea of what something's going to look like. Um, I guess I just can't help myself sometimes, like a little kid. Um, it's not, I'm, I'm only dusting it in for now, I, I, just to give me an idea on how the Deep Bruise Purple works alongside the um, the Payne's Grey. Um, they've sort of got a similar foundation, so they work really, really well together. Um, spraying over the, the Payne's Grey um, just basically creates more of a purple, t purple uh, tone anyway, because um, the Payne's Grey has a blue in it. Uh, so, you know, Obviously, you add a, a bit of blue to a purple mix, it's going to turn to, to more of a blue violet sort of a color. Um, but they, they just, the blues and the reds, you know, because they make purple, they, they work really well together. The other good thing about the deep bruise purple is um, if you spray it uh, thick enough, do enough layers, it can actually have the appearance of a of black. It, it actually goes really dark, and I usually I tend to use that more than black in areas that I would normally have used to use black, because um, I did find that black using black paint can soften things up. Ah, so, not soften, sorry, really flatten things out, and just sometimes looks out of place. So, um, and obviously the the colours in this piece are a kind of a cool cool colour. So, you know, using a lot of blues in this, so I wanted to keep them, you know, similar. You know, the black's just too, too stark. Let's see, I'm using one of my fancy freehand shields that I've cut out for the medallion. Putting some drop shadows in there, and even with those drop shadows, I'm, I'm trying to add texture to them. Um, any chance I get adding texture just just adds adds another layer really helps for depth even the uh, the belt buckles and the areas around here have uh, still got texture in them so I'm just building that up with the uh, airbrush just for uni just to make it more uniform yeah. that soft look to it I've got some blunt trauma armor here um, I picked that as the probably the best option for introducing some color to the leather um, it's kind of an earthier tone so it's it's almost got a bit of a red tint to it um, tiny bit yellow as well um, so it works really well. Um, and it, it seemed to interact well with the, the Payne's Grey as well. Um, but for now all it is, it's, it's just about dusting in some colour, some, some base colour. Um, to give me something to work over, um, I'll add more colours over top of this to, to blend it all in. And, and there's obviously some purples to add over top of that because uh, you know, the whole piece is, is like a bluish purple tone. 
there's not a lot of color in these belt buckles on the uh, reference so there's not a lot of um, the browns that I needed to add so they just needed to be introduced very very lightly Again, just working some detail back in using the end of the paintbrush, the sharpened piece, scratching it in. So now I've actually, um, I have switched to a, the Deep Bruise Purple, uh, just so I can sharpen some of these um, uh, detailed parts up. So obviously where the thread would be on the belt, just adding, or just darkening that up. Um, there's also some textures that look have a purple look to them in the reference picture so just adding some of them in now as well just cool to see um, I've been using the same color for so long the paint's great it's, it's cool to see another color introduced just to see what it's going to look like um, even though this isn't the final, the final colour that will, you know, that I ended up with, um, it's still cool to see just another colour get introduced, um, just to see what effect it has on the rest of the piece. Again, just adding some uh, some colour in throughout the other areas, just for uniformity. So, you know, drifting some of that same colour across, just to just so it matches up. Uh, otherwise, like I said, if I, I come back the next night, the colour might be slightly different. So, it pays to do it there and then. I reckon I actually just uh, added a bit more paint to the mix so I could um, create some darker lines. I'm just adding the textures in there, building up slowly still. Dusting in colour here and there, just working my way around, not sticking in the one spot. You can see here I'm adding in some drop shadows, just really darkening the, those pieces underneath which really makes the belts pop out, quite effective. So I've got a deep bruised purple and then a Payne's grey that I'm mixing together. Um, just to see if it's a little bit darker, just to create some of those, um, the darkest tones, drop shadows. Because now that I've got the, that pretty much mapped out, I can start coming in and systematically starting to darken it where I think it needs darkening.
especially under that little uh, shoulder pad there that's um, probably one of the darkest areas. see the, um, the belt starting to come together now and the colors sort of working well together and there's not a lot of that color that continues down into the lower belts so they're they're pretty right don't need to add too much to them I was keen to add a bit of uh, of the firelight into this piece so bottom right underneath the severed heads there's um, uh, some flames and that is obviously a reflection of that that's a um, that's a highlight using that lighting source that I will have in the in the bottom right corner um, so now back onto the Payne's grey um, just to darken those areas up now that I've got that um, that lighting in there, that uh, that orange lighting, so I can work back over that and tidy it up a bit, and just basically tidy the piece up a little bit with the with the Payne's grey again. I've still got a lot of room to go if I need to to, to darken this piece up. I I kept it a bit lighter just to see how it how it turned out, and um, it probably could stand to go a little bit darker. That um, does turn out right anyway. Right now I'm just working around, just adding bits and pieces here and there, just textures. Now i um, got some coagulated crimson it's called from the Bloodline range. Um, adding in some blood drops on his, on his vest. So probably needed to have a little bit of maybe a, a sepia mixed in with it. Um, I find that sepia mixed in with the, um, the reds, especially the crimson red, uh, you actually um, it gives you a nice deep maroon look to it um, without using black so at the moment though I'm just using the red just to, just to map out some areas I can always come back in over top of them with that darker red 